This week in comic books in DC, it's all about reprints and Halloween. In Marvel, we get gods and Star Wars popping off. And in Independence, it's mostly about Halloween, but with a little He-Man action, too. We're going to break all these down for you, but first I have to try to sell you some coffee, so check this out. Hey, what's going on, folks? This is your boy, Pocan Joe, to talk to you about Coffee Brand Coffee. We serve people that are tired of gimmicky advertising and branded companies that want to lecture you. At Coffee Brand Coffee, all we want to do is serve you freshly roasted coffee wherever you're at, whenever you want it. Consider Coffee Brand Coffee. Check us out, check our reviews out, and use promo code POCANJOE or the link down in the description to save yourself some money. Give me the opportunity to get you a delicious cup of coffee. Hey, you wonderful weirdos. Welcome back to another week of new comic book haul and review. we got quite a few books, so we're just going to jump right into it. The first one we're going to talk about is... DC Ghouls Just Wanna Have Fun. I went with the Glow in the Dark variant, and it does glow in the dark after it's been in the sun for a little bit. A lot of great stories in here. Probably one of the more important ones is the Superman story, where they talk about a, a ghost that's haunting a particular um, psychiatric hospital to some degree, and the guy that owned it uh, was loved by the community, respected by the community, but then turns out to be you know a serial killer. Yeah, and it was creepy. Like his little ghost around there everywhere, all the spirits that he absorbed, they were released, but he himself is still there trapped as a ghost, and he's super creepy looking. I really enjoyed that. Some of the other stories in here were just more gimmicky, fun type stuff. You got Lobo and his daughter, Crush, uh, trying to uh, help her dad pick a costume, and everything was kind of based off Hugh Jackman, kind of, sort of, basically just misunderstanding basic verbiage. And dressing up ridiculously. Um, all in all, it was fun. It's cool. It's a fun little Halloween story. You know, it's just DC being relevant during the Halloween season. So for that, I think I enjoyed it for the most part. Um, but we'll see if this character from Metropolis in the Superman story actually becomes something. I kind of hope so because they really kind of creepy that out a little bit. Kind of want to see a little backstory to that. Kind of like an Arkham in Metropolis, you know where they kind of dived into that lore a little bit. I think that would be kind of cool, and I hope it's something that they do. Moving on. These two books are reprints, and it's Golden Age and the JSA. So, one, I picked them up because they're Golden Age-based characters, um, and they're gold covers, right? That foily kind of gold deal there. Uh, both of these books are fun, interesting. I've already reviewed these books, so if you want a little modern twist on some Golden Age characters... I recommend this, and if you missed the first time that they came out, definitely get them this time. Also, more importantly, one of them has a preview of the new Sandman. I like the old school Golden Age Sandman character with his little canister gun and his mask and just being weird and creepy um, in his best way possible. Uh, but for the most part, uh, they're reprints. But I did pick them up, one, and I reread them because I really hope. And this is my hope out there in the comic book community. Anybody from DC that's watching this, I really hope this flushes out very well into a major event again. After the Lost Children kind of happened, the sidekicks are back, the whole JSA and the daughter of Batman and, and uh, Catwoman uh, being a thing as a huntress now in that particular universe. And I'm really enjoying their villain in this as well. So yeah, he's a time-traveling time-controlling uh, bad guy from World War II. You too. You gotta be careful, right? You can't say certain things. So you get me. Um, and, it, and he's just going around making sure he kills anything Dr. Fate and killing anything JSA on top of it. It's an interesting concept and I'm really enjoying it for that. And it really shows what happens if you can actually control time, how you can kind of do it in a different way than what we're used to seeing before, like traveling in time and strangling a baby or whatever the case may be. And this one actually being able to control it individualized for one person to another person and how time can affect things. I enjoyed it for that. It was interesting and kind of enlightening, but if that was a thing, minus the woo-woo. So yeah, good stuff. Uh, moving into Marvel, we get Marvel, G-O-D-S, or Gods, however you want to have it. Um, didn't know much about this particular book. I went with the Scotty Young variant cover because the wife 
Um, that they didn't have any particularly like great covers to begin with. Um, so this is interesting because I don't know much about this Wynn character. We get Wynn. This is not his first appearance, but it is kind of like his first solo deal, if you will. So all the magic organizations and science organizations have a mutual enemy, a baddie, right? And he's going to destroy everything because that's what baddies do. Right? They just destroy everything. And Wynn is like a John Constantine from the DC Universe. He's kind of weird, eclectic, um, kind of snarky. Nothing bothers him. You know, he just runs through his own process while everybody's doing the major fighting thing. In this one, that's kind of the case, right? He knows to do a trade-up type of thing where he finds a penny and trades it up to this particular book that if the bad guy reads it, it entraps him. So he, we get to see that process. We also find out why he was divorced. Apparently, he was married, and his ex-wife is more on the science side of things, right? And the magic, he's on the magic side of things, and they're supposed to conflict and have a problem with each other. So they can't be married anymore, right? You have to make those decisions and careers, I guess. I, I, I can't relate to that. But at the end, obviously, there's still some romantic notion there. He never wanted the divorce to begin with. So that's the drama part of it, right? Okay, I get it. But it does solidify the connection between the two characters. And that I found probably more interesting than anything else. Um, all in all, it was basically you know, a team-up story. And Doctor Strange showed up. So all you Doctor Strange fans out there... That kind of has this John Constantine, Doctor Strange character too. You should kind of like that character as well. Wen is an interesting character. Unique, not so much. But still enjoyable to read. Alright, next. Alright, our bait and switch for the week. This is going to be a new thing I'm going to do on this channel. Did you get baited and switched? And of course, in Ghost Rider Annual Number 1 is a huge bait and switch for us this week. Because you read, you see the covers, you... We judge books by their covers as comic book collectors, right? We, we do that. I picked this up and I was expecting, oh, a Halloween horror-themed, crazy Ghost Rider story. And it was actually about uh, Alyssa Bloodstone and the lady that Ghost Rider is dating now. It was really about them, where Ghost Rider was a secondary character in his own story. Hey, go fight the giant pumpkin. That happened in this. He had to go fight the giant pumpkin. While well, the other two kind of figure everything out. Now you're probably asking, well, what's the big deal with that? If it wasn't very, I don't know. It, it just really missed for me and everything. Like the, 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 the threat, right, really wasn't there. It almost seemed to gimmicky to some point. Um, and then just had these two randos kind of figure everything out. Like Ghost Rider, I got the book because I wanted to see Ghost Rider. He's like this minimalized character fighting a giant pumpkin. It was just, it, it really missed for me this week. They really could have done something different with that. Good. Hopefully they do something soon with Ghost Rider. All right, moving on. Another one that missed for me. And look, listen to me. This breaks my heart. Like, I, like I'm wounded. My feelings have been wounded in this. Because it's fantastic for uh, number... 12 and I have been on this I've been telling people to read this you get some cool science stuff some cool action stuff and they went super gimmicky on this one where the Fantastic Four gets swept away into a dimensional portal because the worlds are colliding and whatever it doesn't really matter it's all at that point and they're in an alternate universe where everything where the dinosaurs evolved so the Avengers are dinosaurs in this one and they're trying to figure out how to work with the Fantastic Four in this. What happens when two heroes meet for the first time? They have to fight. So that kind of happens. They finally are able to open up the lines of communication and find out, hey, we're all really just good guys trying to figure this out. And why the Fantastic Four humans are here, the Fantastic Four dinosaurs are in our Earth. What we would call our Earth, 616. Um, this is dumb. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. It was just it was lame. It was like, dinos what is the thing with dinosaurs lately? It's weird. Like, I remember as a kid liking dinosaurs. But now as an adult trying to read a comic book, I don't know. It just comes off. It misses for me at this point. Maybe I'm just too old for comic books. I, I don't know. But this was not. No. No. The only cool thing that actually happened in it is if you're dealing with dinosaurs and you're dealing with comic book heroes, you got to do something with Doctor Doom. And, of course, we get a dinosaur Doctor Doom. At the end there is a the, the cliffhanger. Yeah. So moving on. 
another kind of just weird book for me this week. And, and this is where I need you as the comic book community to kind of comment and tell me what you think about this. I'm missing something in the Star Wars lore. And I have a question after my review. And I really want to hear your answer. So we got Star Wars Shadows of the Starlight. So quick breakdown of what's happening in the first issue here, if you don't know. Um, space Station crashes on a planet uh, because there is um, a group out there that are just trying to kill Jedis, right? And I don't know how to pronounce their name. I'm not going to try. Because it's Star Wars. It could be anything. They just throw random letters together these days. And because of this threat of the Jedi, right, the Jedi have to kind of beef up everything that they do, right? So they're shortening training sessions, getting generic lightsabers in kids' hands. Yeah, that actually happens. It's weird, right? They're amping everything up. But the majority of this book was, like, just long-winded dialogue that was kind of unnecessary. Like, there's the whole Senate, right? They're all in the intergalactic Senate. And they're talking about this threat and just... Like, we got it. It's a threat. You got to do the thing. And, and, right? And then the council. And then for some reason, Yoda brings in a guy who's on the dark side of the force, right? Now, normally we would call this person a Sith, but for some reason, he's not a Sith. He just hangs out in the dark side as a bad guy. Like an anti hero, I guess. And uh, he has very different means of taking care of problems, and Yoda's trying to help him face his fear or whatever the emotional element is that would drive somebody to the dark side i i don't know so i asked some star Wars fans of mine what is going on in this and they recommended like 14 things of lore that are outside the known continuity of star wars to kind of look at this and kind of understand this better and i've been noticing this trend here with the comic book community and as talking heads talking comic books and stuff if you dare say something bad about something that recently comes out the first thing that generally happens is well did you watch this this is popular with for some reason everybody's got to go watch all the clone war stuff and, and just understand the bad batch and all this others and rebels and everything else so my question is with the extra knowledge that you have to go go hunt down does it make the story you just read any better I remember when the Bad Batch came out. I watched the Bad Batch, and I was like, this is really not that good. And everybody's like, well, you need to go watch such and such. Rebels or, or Clone Wars, either one. I watched them both. And it didn't make the story better. I just got little tiny bits of information. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe this is just, you know, are, do we like having that knowledge? Because, one, you have the knowledge, right? And it's more of a nostalgia pill. Or does it really enhance the story that you're watching right now and i'm generally wondering out there what the what the consensus of that is have you have you watched something and then we're told to go watch or read something else read it and it was like oh my god it was a great story has anybody gotten that can we can we stop doing that in the community because it, it doesn't make it better at least not in my book if i'm wrong Please let me know in the comments down below. I would love to hear your opinion about this little rant that I just went on. All right. Now we're going to jump right into Independence. I picked up Transformers 1. All the hype for it. And I picked up the 1 in 25 variant. Uh, I thought it was kind of cool. I wanted something kind of rare with the relaunch of Transformers and all the hype that came with it. But then I also saw the villains cover for it as well with Soundwave and Starscream and all that kind of stuff on it and uh, I went ahead and picked that up too. I, I cover bought. I did it again. And I try not to do this. It's so hard. Actually technically I did it three times this week. Oh. Yeah I did it. But this is great because this is a great mixture of updating the lore of Transformers but still maintaining the core source of Transformers. If you're older and you vaguely remember the cartoon, the ship being crashed, what got them released, the whole nine yards, uh, kind of restructuring. Starscream is apparently going to be the leader for a little bit because Megatron's not in the picture as of yet. I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. And then, of course, the interaction of first meeting humans and what they are and not understanding the difference between the machines and humans in our world in the whole nine yards. And then, of course, epic battle just to get you hooked right up off the, off the rip. It was... It was great. It, it was the right amount of 
nostalgia pills, right, for all of us older guys out there, while still introducing a more updated, modern version of the Transformers and what how they would interact. I thought it was great. It was just smart and, and enjoyable. And I'm super happy by it. I wish I could say that about every comic book every week. All right, moving on. Midnight show. It's Halloween time, folks. So it's time to get this uh, Halloween stuff out of the way. And what a better book to do it with than Midnight Show. Number one came out. So this is basically dealing with a cursed movie that was made back in the 40s by an eclectic type director who was very hands-on. A mysterious fire happens during the filming. Film's lost forever. Somebody finds the film and they do a local showing of it. And the local movie theater and fans of horror genre do this kind of stuff i've seen this so they go and watch it but as they're playing the movie all the monsters in it are being released i guess is what we would say or manifesting right in the town doing horrible things to people right so you got the werewolf you got dracula frankenstein a much modern version of frankenstein which i thought was cool and of course dracula and so on and so forth that are kind of being released out into the world and people are like being disappeared while people are watching the movie and laughing along with it. I like it. It's kind of, it, like it reminds me of Last Action Hero, only better. Yeah, that's how I'm going to go with that. All right, moving on. Alice Cooper, number one. So if you don't know, Alice Cooper is going to be having a album drop here soon. Uh, do we say albums anymore? Got to have some music released i think is the way to do it so what better way to do it than alice cooper's original roots and comic books he's been featured in comic books before um but in this one it's kind of weird because the opening scene is a bunch of celebrities you would recognize they all make cameo appearances in it and uh the lucifer is like a, a singer and rock star in it you know the old cliche you know he sold, sold to the devil he a rock star or whatever and Somebody mentions, well, yeah, when you do it here in hell, of course we're going to applaud you. and, and yeah, But you're not really, like, out there trying to do it. So Aerosmith gets involved where he tries to take over Aerosmith. And, of course, Alice Cooper teams up with the angel Gabriel to fight him. It's, oh, it's Alice Cooper, man. Like, it's you can't hate it, as ridiculous as it sounds. The artwork's pretty cool in it. The story's kind of weird, but if it was something with Alice Cooper, I wouldn't expect it to be a mainstream hero type story or what we would traditionally read. It's going to be weird. So it is what it is. Moving on. Forge of Destiny. He Man. So this is getting kind of interesting. So now we're getting to the big battle. We had a little misunderstanding between two nations, right? We got. Eternia and the technically advanced one, whatever. Sun gets jacked up along with his friends. They blame it on Prince Adam. They're trying to leave. Battle ensues. What's going to happen next? It's pretty much the main vein of this story right here. It's just this misunderstanding. And then, of course, at the end, we get left with a clean cliffhanger with a classic uh, He-Man villain. Robo He-Man. Robot. It was kind of interesting. So, so far, this has been good. We haven't gotten the Tila effect yet, but we should soon. She did do some lecturing in it. She's always lecturing. Like, what is that? It's weird. But anyway, that's my comic haul and review for this week. Let me show you a few other things that I picked up just for funsies. Uh, there's going to be a sidewalk sale this weekend at my local comic book shop, and I got a little preview of some of the things that he would have. And a couple of things that I always just kind of pick up, just two books. I'm going to head out there Sunday. So if you haven't yet, hit that notification bell because uh, if I get some stuff, I'll be happy to show you. Uh, probably be picking up some stuff like this. So this is Marvel Team Up featuring Spider-Man and the Not Ready for Prime Time Players. That's right, the Saturday Night Live crew. The little Samurai thing on there. Every time I see this book, if it's a decent price, I will pick it up. And the cool thing about this, the sticker price, everything was half off. So, like, it says $12. I paid $6 for it. And it's in good condition. So, I'm, I'm going to trade up out of my collection. And then this is just a classic cover. Again, another Marvel team-up with Black Widow. as uh, She's kind of on the thing there. These were two that I just couldn't pass up. 
So I figured I'd grab them now before somebody else did in case I make it out there a little bit late. So super thank you to Zeno's Books um, for selling those to me right up off the bat. I appreciate it. And I'll see you this Sunday. So other than that, folks, I got nothing else. I got to head out of here. I'll talk to you all later. Bye.